Welcome back, perfect peeps, to perfect.dev. Today on the show, we have Lee Robinson from Vercel. Hey, Lee, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Great really to excited have you. to uh, break down all the cool new features in Next.js 12. I'm, I'm sure you've probably uh, been talking about them for a while now, but uh, I think it's worth going through again, if you don't mind. I wanted to say the next features for next is what we should name this. <laughs> next for next. Yeah. Oh, man, I meta. have to go update all the, the titles and images. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I, I called it revealing all the next JS 12's features, but I like your next for next. Yeah. Done that. <laughs> What's Hold next on. for next? <laughs> So we, uh, if, if people don't know Lee, um, Lee is part of the developer advocate group at Vercel. Do you want to add a little more of your background, Lee, and kind of what led you into like tech and kind of where you're at and also uh, like joining up to Vercel? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the head of developer relations at Vercel. I have a team of four developer advocates who are all incredible. And I have been at Purcell for a year and a half now, I think. It's and been that long. Wow. Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> and uh, prior to Purcell, I have 10 years of product engineering experience, I guess. So just working on uh, fintech, e-commerce, all sorts of different apps um, as a developer. And then I would say within the last... Five years, I transitioned to do DevRel work on the side, uh, mostly because I didn't realize that that was a career path. <laughs> and then <laughs> I finally realized that, oh, yeah, that you can actually do that for your job. Um, so then uh, moving into a formal position in DevRel when I uh, started working at Vercel. So I've been creating, I've been writing online for like, eight years and creating videos online related to programming for five years, I would say. So I've been doing, been doing this for a while and um, I really enjoy it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Were you doing any open source contributing too? Yeah. So a fun story is that I actually helped adopt Next.js at the previous company that I, I was at. So I had already been kind of part of the Next.js community and, a fan from the outside in um, having, I started using React in like 2015 for a, a job I was working on. So I've been always pretty involved in the front end space. That's always been my my home, my people. And um, yeah. Awesome. That's cool. Um, I'm sure you're, you're, you've found a pretty solid company in Vercel. So uh, things are probably taking off like crazy uh, for you guys and getting busier and busier. Um, yeah. Yeah. So first, first things first, I feel like the, the first item on the list was the Rust compiler. Like, why did the team go after that? That's just crazy to me. Yeah. So from my point of view, we have, you know, in recent years, we've really seen this adoption of new and, and really exploration of new tools aimed at making web development faster. You have tools like ES build tools like Beat that try to um, re-explore what it means to be a fast build tool or a fast tool in the JavaScript space. That was largely the goal of the ES build project in general was just to help JavaScript developers understand that we can actually go a lot further, especially for larger projects. Um, so what that whole movement has has done is helped JavaScript developers think about how can we utilize low level languages to make the infrastructure of how we build for the web faster. And we at Vercel have standardized on using Rust and specifically through a platform called SWC, which stands for Speedy Web Compiler. Uh, <laughs> it's been around for quite a few years, actually. Uh, it's creator, Katie Y. Um, started working on it, I believe like 2017. It's, it's actually been a while, but the 1.0 uh, came out in 2019, I believe. And originally it was just designed just to be a, a compiler, a, a faster alternative to Babel, but it's really an extensible platform built on Rust that allows you to, um, you know, 
do all the things you need to do to build a modern web application. So compilation, bundling, minification, all these things are slowly being explored in the Rust space to improve the performance of, of how you build for the web. So we on the Next.js team and at Vercel have decided to kind of go all in on Rust and make it part of Next.js. So we've replaced Babel inside of Next.js um, with SWC and with Rust, giving you, you know, up to five times faster builds. And also we've done optimizations to get faster refresh or HMR, hot module reloading, when you're mm -hmm. editing locally and, and seeing those changes happen. So if you are not using any custom plugins, essentially you're automatically opted into this workflow. If you have a custom Babel setup, you, it, it doesn't break your app. It still works with your existing setup and just kind of keeps working. So out of the box today, it supports all of the Next.js features, all the Next.js APIs, things like CSS modules or style JSX um, that, that all, all work and is supported. It's even things like post CSS through things like Tailwind. Uh, we just as of today landed an experimental flag for styled components support. So that's still experimental, but we will be nice. working on stabilizing that and making it available in the next release. So stay tuned for that probably in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. We'll see how, how work progresses on that. But we're actively working to um, support the most common use cases that people would opt out of using SWC. I heard you say V in there. Are there any plans? Because it still uses Webpack, right? Correct. Okay. So are there any plans to change from Webpack to maybe use one of the new, newer, faster tools like V? Yeah. So with Webpack, one of the things that we specifically spent quite a bit of time in the past, I don't know, we'll say six months is getting better visibility and insight into what causes a Next.js application to be slow. So we now have a really good tracing system that allows us to get reports back from customers when they understand or when they say, hey, um, you know, my application was running really slow. In the past, it was we were kind of guessing based on their dependencies or getting a reproduction and trying to hit the same slowdown that they saw. Now with this integrated tracing, it's easier for us to understand what caused those things. And we've been able to use that to massively improve the performance of Webpack. So it's kind of interesting because when we make improvements to Webpack, it's actually not just for Next.js. So I don't remember the exact number, but it was a pretty hefty percentage increase. We were able to make Webpack faster for everyone, essentially, wow. which is great. Um, so people using Create React app or just using Webpack in their own custom setups. But we've also been able specifically for the Webpack integration with Next.js to fine tune some of those places where we can... Uh, improve performance. Now, thinking towards the future, there's definitely a world where this turns into Rust, uh, specifically through SWC again. They have a uh, a bundler that is called SWC Pack, which is essentially, you know, <laughs> pretty much the same thing as Webpack. It's just Rustified, so it can be faster. And I think we will get there. Um, we're going to start experimenting with that probably pretty soon. Awesome. Yeah, one thing I was kind of curious about, uh, we, we switched over to 12 and upgraded our site and it was very seamless. It was awesome. Um, mm -hmm. when, when do you start to like see a huge improvement as far as performance on the Rust side of things? Um, I haven't mm -hmm. noticed a lot at all, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm kind of curious if there's like a number of pages or what that looks like. Yeah, definitely like for really large Next.js sites, you're going to see the most improvement in performance, um, specifically for how long the builds take. Um, for, for smaller Next.js sites that maybe only have a couple pages, the improvement won't be as much just because part of the, the time taken during that build process in generating the pages is there's only a couple. So there's not, yeah. there's not a lot to improve on there. Um, but for, for larger sites, 100%, um, you'll see a lot of, improvement in, in build speeds. For hot module reloading, just in general in Next.js, um, those changes should be regardless of the size of app you have. Um, and then I think specifically on 12.0.3, uh, I think we made some 
even more improvements to uh, HMR speed. So I'd recommend doing that patch upgrade too. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I, I know on our Tailwind stuff, when I do global changes, it's definitely faster now. So mm -hmm. uh, I was just kind of curious, like overall, um, you had mentioned tracing for a minute there. Can, can I dive into that for a second? Is there, so I've always done um, kind of the visualize or analyzer um, for like Webpack and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Is there a tracing capability now that it starts printing out like X amount of modules are being used on this page? I'm always trying to get yeah. our like uh, first load JS and things down. Is there a way to like break that down further? Yeah, so specifically the tracing is tracing the Next.js internals. Okay. So like how Webpack is running or how the Next.js loader is running. It's not necessarily used for... Um, like tracing performance of your application from a gotcha. uh, like an end user perspective, um, the bundle analyzer can still help for understanding where large dependencies might be in your application, and then for trying to understand how to reduce uh, like the first load JS. I would still probably say uh, Chrome Dev Tools Analyzer is, does a pretty good job with this, um, and there's a few other tools too. Perfect. Yeah, I was just kind of curious if there was something added. I, I noticed it coming out like in the in the print, like X amount of modules. I'm like, what are they doing here? This is interesting. Yeah, so specifically the reason for that is to help teams understand if you see a, a really large module count there, you might be importing something wrong. So a good example of this is um, there a specific library, the Material UI Icons library. You know, there's a big difference between the single import that imports all of the icons yeah. or like specifically <laughs> importing just the icon you're using. So I think we saw a case where somebody said, Hey, you know, my app's going really, really slow. And they just needed to change their import statement from not including all the modules and just the specific icons. Gotcha. Does the compiler not do any tree shaking on that? It depends on the library. So uh, it depends how the library is, is published. Oh, okay. um, we can work with some of the library authors to fix some of those things, but it's kind of a game of cat and mouse. Like we can try to address as much as possible, but ultimately some of that is on libraries too. Yeah, that's not next, this next problem. <laughs> and that's really what the module thing helps to surface is like, oh, okay. So something is off here. I'm loading 15,000 modules on every every reload or something. Right. Cool. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so switching gears a little bit, uh, middleware, it's a mm -hmm. beta product that's coming out. So it's in the terms that you guys use, enabling full flexibility in Next.js with code over configuration. Um, let's talk about middleware. How is it different than serverless functions? Yep. So the, the core problem that we are trying to solve with middleware is we we talk to teams who are building large Next.js applications and they say, you know, I really like the benefits of having a static site. I like that it's fast. Uh, I like that it allows me to, you know, easily pre-generate my pages, but it's limiting in the fact that I can't do my, you know, dynamic A-B testing or my, uh, flexible internationalized routing on every request. So it'd be great if we could still have that flexibility of being able to customize the, the life cycle of the request and still retain a lot of the benefits of having really, really fast sites. And that's what middleware essentially is setting out to do is to give you some of the flexibility that maybe folks who used to self-host with an express server understand through, oh, I can just add this middleware. And now I can add on my, uh, my redirects or my uh, internationalized routing that I have custom constraints for. And it's a new primitive in Next.js with a new file name, a new API, allowing you to essentially take a request, potentially modify the response and send things back, whether that's different headers or stream HTML or a JSON, um, as well as talk to external APIs. Um, so on Vercel, we take the middleware that you create and we deploy them as edge functions. So this is something where if you self-host it, middleware essentially works pretty much like Express 
middleware. It just runs in front of your requests. And then on Vercel specifically, because we're a serverless platform, it runs as edge functions. And the difference between an edge function and a serverless function is that edge functions aren't the entirety of Node.js. They're a slim down runtime that has no cold starts. So basically you're making the trade-off of, this is something that's gonna run in front of every request. I don't need to include the entirety of Node.js. And because of that, I'm gonna get the performance benefits of having no cold starts and just overall faster execution so I can have lower latency on my requests. So I, I think one of the interesting things, if I dig into the documentation correctly, it looks like it's running the V8 engine under the hood. And and yep. I, I believe I caught your talk at Next.js or, or something came up where they were talking a lot about um, like, how are you going to deal with server side keys and things like that? Can you talk a minute about like how that mind shift or, or like mindset has to shift a little bit when you start to use middleware versus serverless? especially like around keys and things. Could you clarify what you mean about keys? Do you mean um, like- Yeah, so like an API bearer token that you don't want out in like public. Um, environment you variable? Usually, yeah, you would usually use an environment variable. I, mm -hmm. I believe on middleware because it's running V8 though, that kind of exposes you a little bit. Am I off on that? Um, so you can still use environment variables inside of your middleware and it's built on the JavaScript V8 engine and V8 isolates, but it still runs on, it still runs in the server context. So it's not exposed to the browser. Per okay. Se. So um, when you're running on a self-hosted Next.js instance, it's literally running on a server. And in the concept of an edge function, it's running at the edge on the edge servers. Even, you know, serverless is still servers, all that good stuff. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a fun paradigm. I don't know who started it. We should shift off it, though. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you're basically, like, at the CDN running. I, I know you guys are AWS under the hood, so a lot of that documentation probably still applies to all of the kind of the middleware features that are coming out for their edge functions as well. Um, so it's kind of a, a cool concept. I, I just want to reiterate the key things that you guys list out are authentication, bot protection, redirects, browser support, feature flags, A-B testing, server-side analytics, and logging. Those are mm -hmm. kind of the, the main features that you're promoting in middleware at this time. Is there anything mm -hmm. in there that I'm kind of leaving out, Lee? Those are, those are some of the main uh, use cases we see people want to pull for middleware for. And then one thing too, to clarify on the, the infrastructure, um, currently edge functions on Vercel are using Cloudflare workers under the hood. Um, so we are kind of in this AWS and Cloudflare multi-cloud world right now, where we're sure. kind of taking advantage of, of the best parts of both of that infrastructure. Really cool. Yeah. Who, know, who knows what you'll uh, be running on next week? It's always going to be whatever's best for Vercel as a whole, right? Yeah, that's kind of our philosophy, which is as a customer of Vercel, you don't necessarily need to know that. Mm -hmm. um, you just want to have fast infrastructure that works and is integrated with your tools. And yeah. I feel like I might have to start building a decision tree even for like coding cat because uh, I have Google Cloud functions running out of Firebase because like PubSub's a little easier to use on that side. And then I have other things that are hitting like sanity to a, a web worker and those are running on all Vercel, all kind of serverless functions. And it's like, oh, which one do I pick today? So it's kind of fun to go through that stuff on, on serverless. Mm-hmm. Uh, next one is React 18 support. What can we expect with that? I, I know 17, everyone talks about nothing was released. That was exciting. But 18 has a ton of stuff coming out. Um, can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what, what's being released? Yeah, so React 18, um, it's still in development. But there's a lot of things that we're really excited about. And we've been working with the React team to prepare for this future. Um, some of the things that I'm really excited about is um, integrated support for suspense on the server. So I want to call some API and suspend rendering of a certain part of my page until that API resolves. Um, another one is 
server-side streaming. So I talked about edge functions and how you can stream HTML from that. Essentially, what this gives you is a lot better performance when you're doing server rendering uh, because you're able to stream that HTML directly from the edge instead of from potentially like a single origin server. Um, so there's a lot of work that we can do there to optimize that and, and make that a great experience. Uh, and kind of the final piece of, of React 18 that is you know, still in alpha, still being worked on is React server components. And we're also very excited about that. We've been working on integrating it into Next.js so that people can experiment with it and provide the team with feedback. And we'll be sharing um, a public roadmap of that work here pretty soon, probably this week. Very cool. Um, not to put you on the spot, but I'm always curious if you don't have an answer for this one, the server side streaming, what like, what do I tell a person that's like, oh yeah, that's a perfect fit for that. Is mm -hmm. there anything you have in mind for that? Yeah, I would say server side streaming in particular is when teams want to do server rendering, whether that's for uh, SEO or performance, um, they need to have dynamic content generated on every request. But due to you know, the, the place of their database or the requirements of their application, maybe that performance isn't as good as they would like, especially if it's running in front of every single request. Yeah. So server-side streaming and specifically using edge functions will allow you to get better performance and also progressively stream in content. So I think when people think about the word streaming, it can get a little confusing because people use that word in different contexts. So the way I like to think about it is part of my page can load and be interactive before other parts of it load in, which is really important if you're trying to load something that's potentially pretty large and your navigation is able to load in ahead of time and be interactive such that if a person loads your .com and really they just want to click navigation and so some, go somewhere else and they're on 3G, they're able to still do that without being blocked by the server-side rendering. So traditional server-side rendering, it's all or nothing. Either you get all your HTML from the server or you look at the white screen in your browser while it's loading. And um, server-side streaming is allowing you to progressively show updates as that content comes in. So really popular for e-commerce or ad back media or, or things like that. Sounds like, especially in other regions of the world, for sure, as 3G is kind of more prevalent there than, than in the States now. For sure. Interesting. Um, and just to hit on the React server components a little bit, um, what is the difference? Uh, I got this question the other day and it was a little tricky to answer. The difference between uh, like React server components and what Next.js is doing with static pages. Can you kind of like tie in an answer to that question? Yeah. So when you're doing a static page or a server rendered page on Next.js, in both of those instances, you're pre-generating HTML on the server and sending it to your users. So in the static case, it can be you know, cached at your CDN. For the server rendered case, you're still generating on the fly. The end result is you're shipping HTML as a response to your users. Now, with non-React server components, you then have to load your JavaScript on the client, otherwise known as hydrating, to make your page interactive. Now, without server-side streaming, you essentially can't interact with that page until the JavaScript has been downloaded and parsed and executed so that you can click on a button or do a dropdown. And the, the metric that people use with this is like time to interactive. That's the, the web vital that, that teams are That's looking the one at. That always kills us. <laughs> yep, it's an important one. So what server components and server-side streaming are doing is enabling you to keep the benefits of server rendering while still pushing as much logic to your edge network to make fast, uh, fast response times when you're doing server rendering and progressively show updates. 
Now, another benefit of specifically server components in the future will be, um, let's say I have a really large dependency, uh, something for Markdown or something for, I don't know, date formatting or something that you don't want to include in your client side JavaScript bundle. You can essentially eliminate that from having to get sent to the client since that processing is being done on the server. Cool. Great, great explanation. Much, much better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, the other one, or the next one is uh, image, which just had, I think, just a minor update. It now supports AVIF formats. Um, we went ahead and, and contacted Cloudinary since they're they're so kind to me, since I'm a GDE for them. Um, and they flipped on AVIF support, and we started using it. It costs a little more on Cloudinary because it's a little more computationally intensive. Um, but other than that, support's been great through the image component coming on next. Nice. Brittany, yeah, we made it, uh... <laughs> it's, it's only supported in Firefox and Chrome though, right? So are we serving up to other browsers? So luckily Cloudinary, as amazing as they are, if you put the F auto in there, it automatically uh, checks it and says, hey, you get WebP, hey, you get AVIF, whatever is supported. Yeah, Next.js also does that as well too. Um, basically it looks at the accept header to know what type of images your browser can use. Which still blows my mind. I mean, is, I is that something that's happening? Like where you were talking about the streaming, where that's happening before they can interact with the site though. So is that a request that they have to check every time that you're for, serving up that page? For images? Yeah, for Cloudinary. Like, are they checking that before our page loads every time? Um, so they're not doing it before the page load, they're doing it during the initial render of the page. Um, we can mark images as priority if we, they need to be preloaded. And then it's kind of happening at the same, it's, 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 uh, it's request is executed earlier in the life cycle of when the page loads. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's actually on the request of the image, which is kind of mm -hmm. interesting, right? So it, it knows, it sends over headers, and then when it starts throwing the image back, it knows which one's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the AVIF support was a, a minor a minor note, but an important one for, for teams who want to opt into that. Um, it's, it's specifically opt-in because, at least right now, with the current state of AVIF, it's a trade-off of, you get smaller images, but occasionally they can take longer to generate. Yeah. <laughs> but then once they're generated, they're cached. So, you know, there's there's pros and cons to that. But um, from teams who've started to use it, they've been pretty happy with the improvements in performance. So I think it's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. It, it's It's been pretty cool seeing the the download size decreased so much because we like to splatter our page with podcasts and everything else. So it's been great. Mm -hmm. um, next piece, which I completely don't understand, but maybe you can help me out. Bot aware ISR fallback. Is, <laughs> is this essentially like telling Google bot, hey, go fetch something fresh? Basically, if you were doing ISR, incremental static regeneration, where you are deferring building of some pages to runtime. So maybe you only want to generate your top 100 most popular blog posts and the rest you're going to you're going to leave to runtime. Um, there's a mode in ISR that allows you to essentially serve up a loading state. So you immediately serve up a loading state and then you make a request to your database and you fetch your content and then you populate the screen and then after that it's been generated on the next request, it's just cached, right? Yep. So what this is doing is when a web crawler requests that page, it looks at the user agent to know that it's a web crawler and it doesn't send the loading skeleton because then the Google crawler would try to index a loading skeleton, right? So yep. instead it does a blocking rendering if it's a Google bot essentially. And is, is that something you have to add to like Next.js config? To no, but just, it just happens automatically. It just happens. Wow. So we're already getting that. That's amazing. Yep. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I think we already talked a little bit about this, but uh, the native VS module support, um, 
is there anything major to update there other than we can do it? Really, the, the main thing is just trying to get ecosystem uh, compatibility because a lot of packages are starting to publish uh, ESM only or ES module only. And to do that, it needs to be a good experience integrating into Next.js. So that's what we've landed with native, native ESM support. And it also ties into URL imports, which are an extension of that. They using ES modules, they allow you to import packages from any URL. This is still in alpha um, because we're really validating how we've defined the security model for this. Because obviously the first the first thing people say when they see this is, wait, that sounds not good. You can import <laughs> code from any URL. Couldn't that be bad code? Um, so we've we've put some measures in place like making it a defined allow list of the domains that you want to accept code from, and then also having a, a lock file as well too, similar to your local dependencies. And we're going to keep iterating on that too before it becomes stable. Still How does the lock file work if it's dynamic like that? Yeah, I, I believe what it does is it essentially generates some kind of checksum that validates what the code you downloaded is. And it stores that in a lock file with the URL and some, you know, some hash of a checksum of the of the code you got. And then the next time it goes to fetch it, it's essentially cached in your browser based on that. And you can validate and look at the checksum and make sure you're still getting back the same code. I think we need to do more more research here, but I think it'll be neat once it's stable. That's cool. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so not to confuse the two, but URL imports as well. That's a new alpha piece. Yeah, so that's that's essentially what uh, what I'm getting at with like being able to import code from from any URL. It uses Perfect. ES modules, but that's uh, that's probably the best use case for it. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, I feel like I'm probably missing a million things, but those are kind of the ones I had called out across the board. There's some really amazing talks at Next.js Conf. Brittany, is there anything that you're thinking that I'm missing as well? No, the only other thing I might want to add is that I really appreciated that Vercel is reaching out to teams like React and Google is working with teams as well like to just make the web in general a better place. So I wanted to applaud all of y'all for working with other teams and making the web better. Thank you. Yeah, big shout out to the Chrome Aurora team and our collaborators at Google and at the React team at Facebook for really working together and trying to build, build some of these lessons learned, I guess, from larger companies and some of these... Um, opportunities to bring that from the Googles of the world and make it into open source. Uh, you know, a lot of the lessons people learn when you're building a Facebook size application or a Google size application is like, for example, how important images are and how difficult they are to do right. And putting that knowledge into an image component that helps teams make a faster web is uh, very empowering. Uh, before we downshift, I'm going to put you on the spot because I just want to like see if you have a reaction. When we had Tim on, he kind of mentioned next next JS 12 might have this thing in it or Vercel might have it. Um, so we often will have ISR running on those pages like you were talking about. They're not they're not in our pre build or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know we've we've added through the CMS and that's that's out there. But sometimes we mess those pages up. And we have an hour of cache sitting on there right now before it kind of reloads. Mm -hmm. There's there's talk of a way that we could invalidate that at a mm -hmm. file or a page basis. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's maybe occurring soon or yeah, already is? Or Yeah, that's something that I've heard quite a bit from people who use ISR a lot is they want a way to programmatically uh, purge the cache or programmatically purge specific routes. Um, we kind of snuck in a sneak preview of this at the, the conference, which was through what we were calling a, a data component. Um, and it's essentially allowing you to do all the benefits of ISR, but at the component level. 
And in that component, you get to define not only your validation time, but also what a potential surrogate key or cache key is for how you want to invalidate that content. Um, so for example, rather than doing, you know, a full page revalidate prop, you'd be able to, I mean, you still could wrap your entire component tree in, in a data component if you wanted, or you could say specifically for my nav bar data component, fetch from my CMS, revalidate every day. And the cache key is nav. And then maybe I have some other stuff down here. And then I update my nav because I push something new, but I don't want it to wait a day. I can actually hit an API to purge that key specifically. So that's something we're exploring um, as an experimental component that hasn't made its way into Next.js yet, but um, I'm excited about seeing make it into open source. That would be really yeah. nice. There's nothing worse than pushing a blog up and having an error in it and then like realizing it right away and having to mm -hmm. wait. It's the oh no moment. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So is there anything else that, you know, you might have uh, demoed or like done a talk on that you want to call out before we uh, switch gears, Lee? Mm. I know there was a lot that came out in 11 and then 12 seems mm. like it like here's all this more. And at first, I think a lot of people were like, oh, they have Rust for the compiling and that's it. I'm like, well, there was a lot more in there. So I think yeah. we covered it pretty well though. Yeah, I think that's I think that's mostly all the, the big topics to touch on. Cool. So the hot module reloading before we switch over is from the Rust compiler now, right? It's still using Webpack and the, the Rust compiler as well too. Uh, okay, yeah. That's where I was getting confused because I know like SpellKit uses V and we mm -hmm. use the hot module reloading is like faster because of V. So I didn't know how that was working, but yeah, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so we're, uh, we will link out to all the next 12 blog features. Here's kind of the, the site that covers it. Um, like I said, we did an upgrade and it went quite smooth. Um, there was basically nothing that, uh, that shocked me at all. Um, we don't. We didn't have any Babel config or anything like that, so it went pretty smooth. I don't even think uh, Brittany noticed when I pushed it up. <laughs> I didn't notice. <laughs> um, so I'm going to jump into our perfect picks now, and this is just where we do kind of fun picks throughout the day, um, or or on this pod, I should say. My first pick is uh, Lati files. So if you haven't heard of this, it's it's cool. Like there's these lightweight, scalable animations, um, and this came, I believe, out of Airbnb. Like they produced this whole thing. I've been messing around a lot with trying to um, make AJ, who's behind me here, a little more animated throughout our site. And there's a couple different. Um, mechanisms that I've found that work well, but the size on Lati are so incredibly small, it kind of blows me away. So I'm gonna keep churning on it. Um, if you have messed with this and you're listening to this, please uh, DM me. I really wanna know uh, how well it's working out for you. I think that's it for my picks. I forgot to do a personal pick. It's, it's <laughs> on to you, Britt. Yeah, no worries. So my pick is the complete Next.js developer course. I've been a part of the Zero to Mastery community for a while. They released this kind of alongside the Next 12 announcement, and it is updated. They do keep them updated through the future, too. So like for 2023 and on, they'll keep updating them forever. And um, all the courses that they have available have been really great so far. So I suggest you check it out. I'm like staring at this. I can't believe we have an ES 2021. I, I wouldn't have thought like years ago when we were on ES 6 that that would have happened. <laughs> at least they switched it to be the year now, like yeah. instead of the version. <laughs> I agree. Your second pick. Yeah, my second pick kind of went along with a uh, Jamstack Conf that we had about a month ago at the time of recording. And so Jamstack TV is their YouTube channel where you can find all of the conference talks and any other talks that they put on their YouTube channel for the Jamstack. And especially go watch Rich Harris's transitional apps talk. It's amazing. I love it. And yeah, 
It's a really good channel. Do we do we consider this like a competition now, Lee? Is like Jamstack Conf and Next.js Conf, or are we competing at this point? Well, Next.js is a part of the Jamstack. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> Rich's talk was super good. I was a big fan of that. <laughs> it was. It was very interesting for sure. All right, I'll throw it over to Lee for his pick. I think he had something new. Yeah, I wasn't sure what to say, but my new MacBook just showed up. So I'm super excited about this because mine's pretty old. And this is going to make me render my videos so much faster. <laughs> so very so excited about that. I have the M1. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's faster than the original M1, I should say. Um, it's faster than anything I've ever produced anything on. And when I do videos on it, like the CPU and GPU are still a joke. They're, they're not even close to being maxed out. And on my old uh, Mac laptops, it would be completely through the roof. But um, I, I know you got the 14 inch with the pro chip, but I've been hearing amazing things about the max chip. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a ridiculous price, but I think if you're in the market, uh, it's, it's worth it for sure. I'll I'm still stick with my, my Mac mini for my like 800 bucks because it's doing a solid job, but yeah, I, I was sad that I started my job like a month and a half early and they bought me the latest MacBook at the time, but now it's a new one now. Yep, same. I have a 14 inch with the M1 sitting in it. Nice. Well, all right. Well, I, that, hopefully it was a pretty solid and quick summary for all the different things. Go out. I'll, I'll put a link in our, our description and the, the podcast blog of all the next 12 um, conference talks because there's just so many great ones uh, out there and as well as everything else we talked about. So once again, Lee from Vercel, thank you so much for coming on and breaking down next wave, next JS 12 for us. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining. Take care. Later. <laughs>